how it radiates, um, what's around you. When we're testing Wi-Fi, we actually want to think about it as a testing methodology of trying to isolate the thing that we're measuring. So, oh, hi, Rory. The right. talk technically starts at 145, right? I know. I just okay. wanted to get going early. Okay. I didn't know how many people would actually show up. Um, well, it's about uh, doubled since he started. Impressive, yeah. <laughs> One time I had a talk and only three people showed up. <laughs> that was on Apache rewrites, so that's pretty <laughs> abstruse. <laughs> Come on in, welcome. Um, all of these things have, they re relate to each other. Are you close to your access point? Are you far from your access point? Um, are you trying to send a lot of traffic? Or are you looking for a quality of your connection? Do you always want to be connected? Or is, can, can you, do you want to be connecting only briefly? All of this changes with the number of devices in, at, at play. Um, and what, what's the goal? Your venue defines a lot of your goals. So if you're running a sensor network, you might be deploying hundreds of like single, single antenna sensors over a wide area, and you're going to want to optimize your, your frequency and your access point to, to listen for those things. Enterprises typically have multiple access points, and you roam between them. At least that's the goal. Um, public venues can be different than enterprises. You might get roaming, <coughs> but you also probably are uh, invoking things like a captive portal authentication system. You ever go to an airport or you go to a, to a, a stadium, something like that. Uh, that's, that's often different from an enterprise setup. Mostly enterprise setups are looking for an environment that has HR involved with our authentication. So you'd register your device and have a, some kind of auth a different authentication for it. And of course, you know, everyone has Wi-Fi at home. And all of those ways are, are different uh, in how we expect them to behave. What's the sensor network? Sensor network. Um, you, have you heard of those uh, thermostats? those Wi-Fi enabled thermostats, like or your Nest. Um, there's a variety of them. People often use Raspberry Pis to build their own little sensor networks. You have little uh, weather stations. Um, lots of, lo uh, some of the things that you scan goods <coughs> in a warehouse or a grocery store, often those are single antenna Wi-Fi devices too. I'm lumping it all together because they're usually single radio with low bandwidth needs. They usually want to optimize battery life, battery lifetime. Okay. Um, what interrupts your connection? People have opinions on what interrupts their connections. Can you give me some examples? It interferes most of the time for me. Uh-huh. Yeah? Wouldn't anyone else have any suggestions? Like, Okay, saturation, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah? Anyone live near someone that uh, starts up a large electric motor? <laughs> yeah, like some examples of electric motors that you have in your house? Fridge. Fridge, good one. Uh huh. Furnace, especially if there's some panels missing on your furnace. You're Ham missing some furnace. Ham radio guy across the street. Ham radio guy across the street. <laughs> now, if he's act well, he could be operating on 2.4 or 5 if he's doing packet radio. That uh, any other examples? How about a hair dryer? That's another good example too. Um, but that that also often raises your noise floor. Have you guys heard that term before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> not not just your uh, not just the, the the noise in the air can affect it. But every, yeah, yeah, coming in. Not not just uh, 
uh, what your uh, what your internet connection is. Your internet connection could also be part of your Wi-Fi problem. Like some people, their cable modem reboots unexpectedly, or the uh, their DSL connection is slow when everyone in the neighborhood is downloading Netflix. Mm -hmm. Some people think mistake their Wi-Fi quality with actually the upstream provider's broadband capabilities. So it's good to distinguish that. So electric motors affect the stability of Wi-Fi? They can't, well, if, if they are not shielded, I've heard stories of people in warehouses with the, the motors on the cranes would knock out all the Wi-Fi scanners when it rolls over them on the big roof rails. So that includes 2.4 and 5? <coughs> it's broad spectrum radiation. Okay. So motors might be giving off um, maybe a multi-lobe bell-shaped curve of noise, depending on how fast they're going, the, the kinds of windings they have, how open the chassis on the electric motor is. Sure, that. Yeah. Um, how much did I miss? Yeah, yeah. If someone have questions? How much did yes. I miss was the question. Oh. Did you just start? I, I'm just starting. Okay, good. Yeah. I just started a little bit early, mostly with chit chat. Oh, okay. So. Um, Actually, yeah. talking about interference, um, I still notice when I turn on the microwave. Yeah. Yeah. Same uh -huh. frequency. I know, it's it, but it, it, like shielding, come on. Oh, well, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> you can you can buy microwave detectors. You have been able to for thirty years now. It's, my phone is a microwave detector. Yeah, my pocket. That's right. Yeah. But also, you can. I, <laughs> as teenagers, my one of my friends uh, had one of those from his dad's toolkit, and they would walk through um, Sears and test out the microwaves and see which ones would kill you first. <laughs> 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 I don't want a Radio Shack. Yeah. And it, I put it right next to the microwave. It didn't work. So I stuck it in the microwave. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> but well. not after that. <laughs> yeah, single, single test. Yes. Um, but oh, but why, why is, so, uh, what, same frequency. That's a good point. Why is it same frequency? FCC regulations. No, 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 no. Not, not really. No. They allow it. They, they allow it because weather radar isn't always in use. <coughs> weather radar is typically not constantly active, so it's an underutilized area of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. 2.4 and 5 gigahertz are great at reflecting water. That's why it's used for weather radar. So that's also why certain frequencies you can get bounced off of. Those are your DFS frequencies. And so it's not actually legal to not bounce off of those. In fact, you're supposed to, your AP manufacturers are required to be able to validate that they move out of the DFS channels within milliseconds or so. What is, what, what is the acronym? DFS. Dynamic frequency selection. Shift. Okay. Shift. Okay. Shift. Yeah. yeah. Um, but is that a new requirement to shift because some older APs? Right? Uh, those would be out of spec APs on, if if they serve if they serve DFS channels at all. But um, early or like, I think that was even a requirement for for 802.11n. So and that's. That was 2006 or so. I have a slide deep down that we can look People at those details. People are saying telcos are going to start using 5 gigahertz. Is that going to interfere with Wi-Fi? Mm, telcos are pretty tightly regulated okay. in terms of how they use spectrum. Okay. Um, so you could also say that Comcast is a telco and already using it in all of the residential uh, firewalls or the residential gateways that they put out there. That's why you see Xfinity in your in your SSID list all, everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. So, but actual network. So back to my slide. Things that people can confuse with bad Wi-Fi include just poor network uh, features like 
really long DNS times. You guys ever switch to 8.8.8.8 or 1.1.1.1 or 8.8.4.4? Uh huh. Better DNS responsiveness. Um, uh, do you do download tests? Okay. Do you need a particular amount of download for your Wi-Fi for for your application? Um, or going back to the venues notion, do you have like, the capacity to handle? dozens, hundreds, or thousands of users? And are they being treated equitably? Are they all able to get roughly the same amount of bandwidth all at once? Is speed test not, not a good idea when testing Wi-Fi? What does that, what, what does that entail? DSL reports and better things jitter. But is it appropriate for testing Wi-Fi? No, that, no, it's basically it's testing your connection to whatever that your internet connection, not exactly, right, just exactly. Just like and so it, it's a really important distinction for a home user because there's not really a really good way for a home user to set up a Wi-Fi only test unless they measure something like a download off a of NAS or their laptop. Then not a lot of people even connect their laptops with an Ethernet cable anymore. Speed test used to have something called Speed Test Mini. You could self-host and then speed test locally. That's I nice. I think they've gotten rid of that. Huh. We 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 self-host speed test on our server. Hey, so when anybody right. so if it goes to speed test on that, it says you would, the week they connect to mm -hmm. you know Airbridge Broadband and Kuski, and so they they don't they're not going to Spokane or anything. They're going right there. So that makes a lot of sense. Test. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. What of Wi-Fi AC manufacturers still send in their devices and their routers? Large overhead. It's not a it's, it's not a checkbox they have to fill. <laughs> yeah, you, and when, you when you're when you're in the in the in the product design phase of something, adding a adding a feature like that just hasn't been asked for. So and it's not what other other APs are. Well, it might be it might be different for an enterprise AP. Like if you look at the control panel for for a Ubiquity or a, an Aruba or something like that that has enterprise feature set, then you probably have tooling on on those kinds of deployments for doing speed tests as part of a, a you know an enterprise rollout. But for a home user, that's that would just be probably money not well spent. Yeah. So. Um, but all of this, so your wireless speed could also depend on your wired speed. Um, are you are you downloading something uh, from uh, from a NAS? Is it are you actually testing the speed of your spinning hard drive? Are you actually testing the speed of a hundred megabit switch that's in your home? So so there's there's steps along the way to consider, like, if this is not a gigabit switch or router to, to the cloud, then that's going to be your, probably your slowest point. Your phone and your AP might, might have a, might be able to do much better than whatever the cabling is to your laptop. But this green path is really, ideally, what we want to be testing. Speedtest.net involves your, your broadband connection outside your house. And for testing the capability of your own home Wi-Fi or your own enterprise Wi-Fi, you really want to limit it to the green path. Hi. Any questions so far? <laughs> you just walked in, yes. Uh huh. Um, the uh, you, so it seems pretty clear. We want uh, we want our upstream, which is going to be sending us traffic uh, on the same LAN as our access point, and um, we. We, to be a good upstream, we also want to be running something hopefully faster than whatever our device is that's downloading it. Because if our phone is better than the Raspberry Pi we're downloading from, 
We're actually testing the Raspberry Pi, not our phone. Slowest component. Yes, exactly. You want to identify the slowest component in that chain. Um, so, so definitely if you hook up your laptop, it's probably a better bet because it's got a better networking chip in it than a Raspberry Pi. That's where I'm going with that. Pretty clear, right? Uh huh. Um, and really, the uh, all your wireless tools on on your Android phones and your NASes and um, half your access points, they're all based around open source packages. You've got your Intel wireless tools for determining uh, what what your radio is doing. WPA supplicant negotiates. Uh, uh, authentication with your AP, your access point is probably running host APD, and all of all of your packets are going through routes set up by IP route two. So all of this stuff has lots and lots of documentation if you want to if you want to dive into it. But on most of the equipment you buy, you're probably going to be touching those packages at the low level. It's all invisible now because it's so common. Um, your Wi-Fi hardware is interesting. It really holds a lot of magic. Um, your, your phone could have a one by one or a two by two MIMO radio in it. And that is, that is a, a way of encoding traffic. And it also has to do with how many antennas you have access to. Now, uh, two by two radios have two antennas. One by one radio, so one antenna. An access point might have four antennas now, or I've seen some with eight antennas. That's pretty wild. Um, and sometimes you can't even count the number of antennas on your device because they're actually on the circuit board. <laughs> so one by one and uh, two by two are typically your <coughs> common options and <laughs> Three by three and four by four are usually your your high speed options, and you're probably not going to find a three by three radio in a laptop. So uh, we can we can go over the charts of what those speeds are later if you're interested. They're <coughs> they're backwards compatible, right? Like yes. a one by one phone could connect to a three by three AP. Yes. But you're uh -huh. going to be limited by the one by one on the phone. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yes. So when, when devices associate to access points, they negotiate a rate, and they'll try and figure out the, the best rate for the noise floor and the choice of encodings each device has. Well, if, if you connect a one by one phone to a two by two AP, is that one connection only gonna be one by one, or is it gonna drag it's the gonna whole AP down so that everybody on that AP will be suddenly one by one? That's a great question. Each, each client of that access point negotiates a different rate, and they might do it every few milliseconds, because when your device moves, you are constantly getting a different possible background noise, different frequency range. You could, just sitting still, depending on the, your environmental factors, people moving around you, you get different reflections, you can negotiate a a new rate, new encoding, several times a second. So one by one devices are not going to change the behavior of an adjacent two by two device. Okay. Unless you're really, really old and are using it a 211B. Okay. That, <laughs> that's about as slow as you can get and it takes so much air time, it's best to just toss those things in the waste. And be so the whole, the yep. whole channel yep. down. Yes. Uh huh. So best upgrade that old equipment when you get the chance. Yes. Okay. Um, but here's some here's some notes on uh, interesting interesting uh, differences in your up possible upstream chipset. Um, you know your your Raspberry Pi can do about 100 megabits, but it's on a USB bus. And that's how they power the that's how they power Ethernet port on that. And Odroid C1 
can do a gigabit, and, and it's on like a PCI version one, possibly. I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, but your ThinkPad, that's going to be on a PCIe two backplane, and so you're going to have the best possible upstream bandwidth with the wired port on on your ThinkPad, say. So that's going to compare to the performance of of a, a NAS with a, a gigabit chip or or a tower PC. What do you use on your phone? What do we actually use to, to connect with, to do a speed test? Are any of these things familiar? Have you guys heard of iPerf? Yeah. Uh -huh. iPerf is effectively the common standard for testing, testing bandwidth. You can use it on wired connections. You can use it. It's just, it's just a, you have a choice of TCP or UDP. Um, but you can run iPerf on your phone as a client. And if you're lucky, you can also run iPerf on your phone as a server, too, which is an interesting and an uncommon option. Often you're going to be running iPerf as a server on something like your laptop, and you're going to bind it to your, um, you're going to run it with your your wired Ethernet port, because these guys usually are just in client mode. Can you, can you show us how to run that maybe later on? Yeah. Yeah, I have a slide for that. Uh -huh. um, uh, there's a couple of different uh, uh, different apps that could be useful. Um, Hurricane Electric has an app on, on the uh, Play Store that, that does various versions of iPerf. Um, and if you want to uh, want to copy files, um, your NAS usually supports Samba. And uh, a good way to explore your local network, like your, your Windows shares or, or your, your NAS, is the Explore app on Android. And that can copy stuff, and it can tell you how long it takes and what your, what your bit rate is for, for download. So you could download an ISO image to your phone and just watch the rate go up and down as people walk through the room. <coughs> uh, the IP command. It looks like kind of character spaghetti up there, doesn't it? <laughs> so you're going to open a terminal, and you're going to learn about your the, the DHCP address you got with the IPA show command. IPA is short for IP address. Your radio is usually going to begin with a W. Linux names radios and devices in weird ways. Yes. Is there a way from the IP command I can get which uh, wireless protocol it's using, BG and that sort of thing? East tool does that, I think. Well, there is there is that East tool. There's also the IW command. IW, and IW, yeah. Yes. And I have a slide for that. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> we start by finding our, our IP address so that when we want to get to the, um, uh, the iperf uh, command, we know what IP address we're going to be using it from. So our link ether here, this is good to know. That's our MAC address, our IP address, and that's our subnet mask. So that just tells you how big the address space on your network is. It's usually not very important because everyone usually chooses a, a slash 24. Um, if you're on Android, you can find out some of the stuff just in the settings, uh, settings on your phone, just under the gear menu. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of network utility apps in the iStore. There's too many to list. You'll find one. IWList allows you to see what rates are available and what you're connected to. So the IWList and your device and scan will show you all of the APs that are in range. So here, we're connected on channel 11 to something that's right nearby. So we have a good quality signal. We are at negative 31 dBm, which is a really strong signal, so that, that access point might be just on the same table as my laptop. 
Uh, and we're connected to the SSID, is that what we're saying? It's listed as an ESSID, that's the official term for your, your network name. And these are the available bit rates that we have. And if we are, uh, we have good quality signal, we have plenty of power, chances are I can get 54 megabits. Now, that doesn't seem like much, does it? But that's pretty good for 2.4. <laughs> Any questions on this so far? This yeah, a couple. What? Yeah. The IW list software. First uh -huh. of all, is that um, common package for yeah. most distros? Most distros are using the the IW package, and this is one of the utilities in that package. And then the bit rates that are shown. Yeah. Is that something that is actually calculating or having a communication with the? Your access point is going to tell you, I have these bit rates available, and this this is what Cyrus N provides, and it's only going going to show you the bit rates available for the that your radio can negotiate. So if Cyrus N also supported five gigahertz, it would do that on a different band with different encodings, but the radio, you know. WLP1S0 only supports these bands at 2.4. These these bit rates at 2.4. Okay. So this is this is what matches and what is available for that SSID. Nice. Right. Yes. The quality, the, quality uh, the number before and after the slash. Well, I haven't read closely about how they how they calculate that quality. Okay. There's. It looks good to me because it, it adds up to one there, you know? <laughs> if it were 35 out of 70, that's probably a pretty poor connection. I would expect it to vary with the DBM. If we were at like negative 72, we might be looking at a 35 out of 70 or, or something 70 like that. 70 would be the absolute maximum. Well, that would be the denominator here, so yeah. Uh, I didn't know if that was maybe upstream and downstream or... That's a good question too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know if it goes up to 100. I've never really watched that. I. I I have tools that tell me that in a different way oh, that I'm not actually going to show you because that was at my table. Okay. So that's okay. You could talk to me about it more. Your your bit rates are are you really going to get 54 megabits per second or are you really going to get you know realistically like 25 out of the you know I mean, you that goes back to what you negotiate with with the radio. So your your, your access point is going to say, hey, let's start off as fast as we can, and then we're going to pay attention to our loss rate. If our loss rate goes up, it says, hey, this encoding is failing, let's bump it down. That encoding still, still has a high loss rate, we just move down until we get to something where we have a low loss rate. Can it move up? Or just and it can move up. In fact, it can move up if, say, Everyone clears a path between you and the access point. It tries to renegotiate this several times a second, mm -hmm. so your rate will adapt to your environment. Good to know. Yeah. More questions? There's a lot to take in on this screen. Sitarala, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, so this is uh, the physically edited rate at which the packets are being sent. But if, you, if your question was about uh, higher layer throughput, what do you get at TCP and UDP level? That could be lower because uh, Wi-Fi uses an acknowledgement-based protocol, so you have to contend for the medium. And so you spend some time contending for the medium, and then once you win, win the medium, you transmit a pa packet, and then the receiver has to wait for a little time and then send an acknowledgement, which is not actual payload. It's overhead, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. even though you're technically transmitting at 54 megabit per second at the file layer, you are, in, in fact, you, getting 20, you've got, 25. Yeah, you know. you've got your TCP, IP, or yeah. and all that other yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 That's going just in the Wi-Fi packets. So. Yeah, there's, and you're, you also have to leave room for, for the AP to send out beacons, and stations also send out probes. And that all takes like airtime as well. Process. Pardon me? I love using Airmon and AirDump NG looking at probing process. Oh yeah, yeah. You can you can get your radio to show you all of that when you put it into, into monitor, monitor mode. 
Wireshark is fun. Yes, Wireshark, Wireshark yeah. is fun. Yeah, but to see those kinds of packets. I actually have it running right now. I'm looking to see what people are poking for. <laughs> <laughs> but that also, when you put your radio into monitor mode like that, you actually take it off the network because you have to. You can't be associated and also yeah. listen to all of those beacons. And, it, usually, and people have two separate radios: one for the real AP and one for monitor. Yes. Right. Yeah. You're the kind of person where I, I leave Wi-Fi off yes. on my phone. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm the reason why you need a VPN if you're going to be using Wi-Fi. Period. Yeah. <laughs> Full stop. Uh, okay. Should I? Should we move on? Yep. Okay. We're actually. Whoop. We're actually pretty. We're we're pretty close to the end of of my my overview slides, so we can get on to more interesting discussion. Um, so now, besides your signal strength, well, is signal strength a good indication of how fast you can go? No. Right. Unnecessary. Not necessary. Is it possible to have too much signal? Good question. <laughs> yes. It is possible. Your radio will actually clip the incoming signal if it's too hot. And that's not decodable information at that point. So if you put your access point right next to your laptop, you might be negotiating a much lower rate huh. just to contend with a hot signal. So if you look at the if you look at the, the power the DBI, the, the DBM you get, and if you're way up in the twenties, that's too high. You should, you will do much better if you're at like negative 45 to negative 65, which is perfectly capable of just being across the room. So it's when you start going through walls is when you get into the, the negative 70s and, and so forth. So having, ha, you can still get good throughput if your Wi-Fi access point is somewhere in the room but not right next to you. I think you said this before. Does yes. So if your laptop in that situation is negotiated a lower rate, uh -huh. but me sitting across the room, do I have to talk at your same low rate? Or does, can I do it a different No, way? because the rates are per client. Per client. Yes. So you you get airtime, I'll get airtime. It's up to the AP to divide it equally. <coughs> So if you have an AP that's got the Atheros chipset, which you can actually hack the firmware to use, so you got channels 1 through 13, you can actually push it higher to like channels 14, 15. So if I got my AP on channel 15 and my client on 15, nobody else is using that channel, so all it's like pure right. Right? Now, now you're out of region spec. Region right. spec, right. yeah. So I yes. know some people will go in and they'll put their region to world or zero, zero. You could you could do that, or you could set it to German, German or yeah. you could set it to Japan. Japan, yeah. Um, There's legal. It's actually it's there? you're you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> but you can. You can. You physically well, can. Well, yeah, yeah. You physically can in a test environment, and you would to legal to to get away with that in a rational way. You would want to be in a lab yeah, yeah. that was not polluting your airspace of the public. Right. So. If you're in maybe an isolation chamber, or maybe your home, yeah. it's not going to bother anyone. Yeah. Try doing that at an airport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, signal strength. Uh, you want Wi-Fi radios are good at decoding things and building up a lossy signal. They're, when the signal's too hot, there's nothing to rebuild. Available airtime. That's how much time each client can get. The lower the encoding rate, the especially with 802.11b, the longer the frame sizes were, everyone gets less air time. Your, your available air time is often uh, called your, um, like the usage, the usage statistic. So if you have too many people all requesting stuff all at once, you run out of air time, you could just get dropped, or your connection could get interrupted. And in that condition, you can start increasing the congestion of the network by repeatedly sending packets to try and make your connection complete. So if you're able to measure the airtime of your environment, if it gets into 70% or 80%, that's functionally saturated. 
because that doesn't leave you enough headroom to deal with resends in situations like that. How has airtime changed with you know, G, A, C, and now A, X? Well, the better your encoding rate, the more available airtime you get okay. because you have to send the same amount of traffic with fewer packets. Okay. So encouraging a minimum, of minimum standard for your clients can be very helpful in increasing the throughput of all the clients. And so very often you have an option in an access point to disallow B or G rates. And so if you keep those things off the air, then there's a lot more airtime for everyone else. Okay. Um, but air is, is a shared media, like frequency is a shared media. And until recently, only one thing can transmit on one channel at a time. Now we're all transmitting all the time because we're only using microseconds of airtime per packet. But things that aren't working well together, they'll collide. Then they have to back off and they randomly choose a time to retry. When your available airtime is decreased, all those collisions are happening a lot more frequently. So, so that's where eventually you get into channel planning. So we uh, we, we send video, real time video uh -huh. over Wi-Fi. Yes. On a vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. Inherently unreliable, but. But that's why the, that's why you have TCP. That's why we have USB. But, uh -huh. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. So we were testing packet size. Yes. In a congested environment, you actually want a smaller, a little bit of a smaller packet size. Because of those resends. Point. Yes. You don't want to have to resend a big packet if you can just resend Send a little packets. one. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. You can change the size of your network packet size on your access point if you want to <coughs> encourage smaller packet sizes. So and that's called your MTU, your maximum transfer unit. That's that's a standard network setting. Your 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 USB. Um, Your cable modem or your DSL modem also have smaller than maximum MTUs, mm -hmm. not only to pay attention to whatever whatever point-to-point -point protocol is stacked on top of it when it goes on the, the broadband wire, but also because that allows for retransmits on their, their side too. It's why we don't have a 9,000 byte size MTU for the internet yet because then, the, then your people would be retransmitting nearly 10K on every retransmit, so. Right. So do you want a lower or a higher MTU, generally? Well, ultimately that depends on what you're trying to transport and how reliable your environment is. Okay. If you have a very quiet environment, you can get away with a larger MTU because you're less likely to retransmit. Isn't 1500 kind of standard? Yeah. 1500 standard on, on your ethernet LAN. LAN, yeah. yeah. Uh, but when you, you go through gateways and stuff, then it starts shrinking just because their MT is probably 1500 or 1478 or 1465. So it's and pretty close so to that. They're getting reassembled and re. Yes. Every. Yes. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you ever want to slow down your network a lot, choose a really large MTU and try and go on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> know why that's going to slow you down? So it's going to force your gateway device, split your packet in half, or into its MTU, and then it fills up its buffer, and it has to recreate the packets. I don't suggest it. <laughs> um, the things in the room with you are also affecting your channel. Um, if, you're, if you've got a 2.4 gigahertz radio, and you've chosen channel 9, how many channels are you functionally affecting? The neighboring six channels. All your neighboring yeah. channels. Yeah. If everyone sticks to channel 1, 6, and 11, they only have a minimum of side channel interference. If I'm on 9, I'm, I'm taking time away from 6 and 11. Because if I'm on 9, no one, <laughs> it's the noise floor. I'm adding to the noise floor for 6 and 11. So that's less time for everyone else. It's very polite to stick to 1, 6, and 11. 
the older access point. Thirteen is Japanese, I yeah, think. Yeah, but it's but it's not doesn't yes. interfere with yeah, the Yeah, it won't. Yeah, thirteen is another logical one too. Uh -huh. um, but it's it's politic to choose yeah. one six and eleven. <laughs> um, now with your your AC routers, you have a choice of eighty megahertz, forty megahertz, or twenty megahertz. When do you want to choose choose that? Like, which one do you want to choose? You can transmit the most per client at 80. That but distance? That that you could choose distance. Interference or interference. interference. What about your available airtime? If, you, if you're supporting hundreds of people, then you want them all to transmit it you know, concurrently. Do you want to have a channel plan that allows a bunch of smaller channels to be transmitting at the same time? Seems like so the narrower the bandwidth, the, the more channels. You yes, can go in. exactly. So if I have if I have a venue, I will come up with a channel plan that like a large venue, and it's probably going to look like a hexagonal grid where I have these channels such that no adjacent channel is touching an adjacent access point. So I'm going to go you know, 36, uh, 161, 54, uh, 155. I'm going to skip channels. I don't want to go 36, 42, 48, because those are all going to cause side channel interference for each other. It's, it's not a lot, but it does raise the noise floor when you have them physically adjacent to one another. So it, it would be better to have four 20 megahertz APs than one 80. Yes, for, for many people. For many, if you have a lot for, of people. For many people. Yeah. Or you might have environments where you have outdoor, uh, outdoor venues. And outdoor venues, you don't have reflection. Uh, 802.11ac really provides good support for uh, echo you know, backscatter interpretation at, at the radio level. And so that's why you started seeing third antennas and fourth antennas on things, not just for your MIMO, but also because it's a smarter, this chip's got smarter. But outside, you really don't have much backscatter. And to, to have a, the lowest reasonable noise floor, you actually want the narrowest channel because noise is proportional to the amount of spectrum you're taking up. So it makes sense to have a smaller channel outside because you're probably going to have a higher overall environmental noise. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. But if you're trying to ship video, say somewhere between you know, high def video or uh, file transfers be between vehicles and, and a base station, you might want to have an area that is well controlled and has an 80 megahertz channel, so that you can you can get the best performance for the for a limited number of clients. But if you have 20 buses and you're uploading their their webcams all at once, you might want to choose a, a 20 megahertz channel per bus, and have and maybe even you know. Make sure that you know you have a have set up a roaming environment that is really particular about only allowing one client per per radio per AP, even. So it can get interesting. You can do a lot with it. Any questions so far? Anyone asleep? <laughs> yeah. Are there any tools that allow you to look at the spectrum? Open source yes. tools. Open source tools that allow you to look oh, at yeah. the spectrum. Any yeah. software that buys yeah. video would do it. Well, there's there are there, uh, yeah, there there's a number of tools that allow you to, to graph that, and um, the the free tools are not nearly as interesting as the for pay tools. Mm -hmm. For pay tools give you really pretty graphs. Yeah, I've seen them, uh -huh. but I was wondering if there was a reasonable open source equivalent. To uh, um. Because Kismet, Kismet doesn't really do that, I don't think, Kismet, right? Yeah. And um, Wireshark, I don't think, does either. If you're on Windows, a, a nice way to display it is with acrylic. 
and there's oh. there's things like a, like acrylic. There's a there's a Wi-Fi scanner you can get on um, on Ubuntu, and I forget the name of it. Um, so, but also, if you it. If you have the time, you can also write a Perl script to parse IW list, and it'll tell you all the SSIDs and channels and, and whatnot. Um, I wish I had a I wish I had a better recommendation on that. I just haven't had time to to, to focus on that particularly. So, if you want to repeatedly test, you're probably looking at using just a few tools and writing a script to operate. You know, your laptop and wireless card, Linux, makes you perfectly prepared to do this in almost any setting. You have iPerf, uh, you can use uh, Jim Salter's NetBurn, which is another interesting traffic generator. You can even use SCP to, to copy stuff, because SCP has a nice graph, or a nice little status bar that tells you your bit rate for your copy. And it's probably the most convenient thing because it's the least amount of least amount of effort to script. Um, iperf three is available in all the repos, and if you're on Ubuntu, uh, iperf three needs the firewall disabled, or you open up the ports for it. But you can briefly disable your firewall, run iperf three minus s to become a server, and make sure your Ethernet laptop is plugged into the wall or your switch because it's really embarrassing when fire it up and it's not plugged into anything. Who's done that? Me? Um, there are a number of iPerf apps and uh, uh, some of them give you various versions of iPerf. If you install iPerf 3 on your laptop and you try an iPerf 1 or iPerf 2 client, it's not going to talk. So make sure your version of iPerf it matches what you're running on, on the laptop. Um, HENet supports iPerf2 and iPerf3. Um, uh, Jim Salter, who's also presenting right now somewhere else in the building, uh, he has a couple of network testing tools on GitHub. Um, another handy thing to do when you're doing speed tests, if you like to do downloads of something on your LAN, Set up Apache or Nginx and put a couple ISO files up there. Those take a good long time to download or not, depending on how good your network is. Um, so if you wanted to combine those two, you could turn NetBurn on and just download something from Apache on your LAN over Ethernet. That would be certainly easy enough to do. It won't take you a lot of time to set up. Um, things to monitor how much traffic is going both over your Wi-Fi and or over your Ethernet port. One I like is IFTOP and it's a CLI meter um, and I'm constantly using that just over SSH. I will SSH into something, become root, pop up an ITOP, ETH0 and it shows me what host is downloading at what rate. Uh, NetPerf is another one. It's a little bit fancier. There is a lot of really crazy stuff out there, like Flint, which also uses uh, NetPerf. But if you want to test your buffer bloat conditions, and if you know anything about buffer bloat, you probably know as much as me on using it. And I wouldn't even suggest going to MGen. You'll come across it, and it's. It's got more syntax than, than I care to even look at. So, um, but NetPerf and IFTOP, those are those are the simple ones. These tools have existed for a long time. In fact, we just we covered this slide. I think I copied it. Um, if if you hear things like Air Magnet, Ekahow, Tamagraph, Landforge, Ixia, these are all expensive tools. Some of them have free versions that are probably on a fuse. If you listen to Wi-Fi, like a Wi-Fi focused podcast, recently Ekahow came out with a, with a wearable laptop sized device. They sell you the whole thing with battery on one side and laptop on the other and 
radio antennas sticking out. You can do site surveys, so that's called site kick. People are pretty excited about that one these days. Um, but but this stuff for this stuff it generally it's used in a lab by equipment manufacturers. The site survey tools would be for installers usually going and verifying how much coverage you have in an area. And at this point, let's just stick to questions. And if you guys want to know details on particular versions of uh, uh, the 802.11 specs, I've got a slide for each of those. But um, <coughs> it's all you now. I get a touch on now. like WPA3 and it's coming. I certainly can. Yeah, WPA3. It will be um, cracked, but it'll be a while still. <laughs> <laughs> Like if you're going to be packed. using Wi-Fi period, you should definitely use a VPN. If you're not, then start. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's reasonable. Yeah. Um, Especially if you're going to do online banking at like a coffee shop or. That's about online VPN banking there. at a coffee shop. I mean, <laughs> someone laughed at that. I think that that's a, that's a legitimate joke. I understand. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's, it is kind of a yeah. Over a VPN though. Over a VPN is a lot more reasonable. Um, Oh, SSH encrypted. Well, open SSL. You oh, SSL. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but other questions? What, what is, uh, what's um, the major differences between WPA3 and 2? WPA3 supports opportunistic encryptions. Mm. And so you can, it That's allows you, excuse me? Because 2 is broken. That's why they're making 3. <laughs> Um, show, yeah. Well, <coughs> we're not going to see widespread support for three for, oh, wow. for a couple of years because that we have so many things coming out at the same time, and all of our WPA2 equipment is going to age out over many years. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're going to be making a quick jump. Um, but oppor opportunistic encryption is where you can associate to an, uh, an I, uh, access point and you get the same, same or better encryption that you would have had if you had explicitly set up um, an enterprise grade encryption with WPA2. But it's gonna negotiate that automatically. So that's, that's the big distinction there. There's a, there's a couple more uh, things having to do with details. But the opportunistic encryption is, is the big win for that. Yeah. Next question? That means no passphrase. Uh, well, now, a passphrase is a good way to administer, is to provision access. So you, there's no reason not to have a passphrase. But, I'm saying but if you wanted to, if you wanted to have a public venue, yeah. everyone would be highly encrypted and isolated from each other. Right, if they didn't have Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, I have a slightly unusual setup. I'm not extremely unusual, just a little bit. My roommate did not appreciate the 100-foot Ethernet cable snaking from the living room up the stairs and into my room. <laughs> and so I got a wireless router and configured it as an to act as, as a client to the uh -huh. modem. And then I have little Ethernet cables going to each of my machines. Now the problem I have is that I like to play online video games and I notice that when my roommate's home, every now and then I get like these little lag chunks that uh, disrupt my game and make me very unhappy. I've tried setting up QoS to prioritize my packets, but uh, somehow between the two uh, boxes, the weird proprietary modem with a terrible interface and uh, the open WRT derivative, Libre CMC that I have, I always bungle QoS. Uh, but I'm wondering uh, how would I diagnose where the issue is, uh, that the latency issue, I think it's a latency issue, trace sure. or drop, drop oh. packets. Trace the route up here. Well, well, well I can trace it, right. but that, that will tell me, because uh, like, it only happens every now and then that the packets get dropped. And I, I, my guess is that what happens is he goes to like, you know, some new site and it opens up 500 TCP connections and completely throttles the uh, connection for you know, a couple seconds. Have because it comes in a couple seconds at a time. It's not a constant lag. It's a uh, irritational lag. Have a right. bandwidth monitoring tool on your open route. 
What one monitoring tool? There's tons. Okay. I wrote one. Several other people have written some. <laughs> Well, you have you Wi-Fi in the mix. Like wire aid mm -hmm. to see all the connections, and then you could also use pin plotter yes. from your machine yeah. to wherever you're going. Right. Smoke or ping is a, is a useful or utility for charting that. What is it? Smoke ping. Smoke ping. Okay. Right. But you would want to say say we use smoke ping in in your situation. And these are going to be UDP packets, by the way, that are being dropped. So not TCP. Just okay. Yeah, Sure. Um, well, the benefit of UDP is that you're not doing retries. You're just yeah. moving along. Um, but you still have Wi-Fi in the mix. And it, are you in an apartment? Um, townhome. OK. Um, Duplex, sorry. Sure. <laughs> uh, do, you hear a, do you hear a lawnmower? No. When when the packet loss happens, no, because that goes back to the to the small engines also adding to noise in your environment too. No, it's only when he's home. Okay, Once he goes so to that, I, I can plan. I don't have any lag. Okay. So uh, maybe have have your buddy get his own internet or. <laughs> well, the you own that's the, 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 well, he yeah. owns the house. I'm renting from himself. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 He's using wireless as well. His packets. Could yes. Be so if if he is sure if if here. if he's if he's also sh is sharing is sharing the wireless with you. Yeah. yeah. And so your access point is splitting time. Yeah. On that, so you. The best bet would be buy your own access point. Yes. Put it on a different channel, and then I you have then you have your own then you have your own channel spectrum that you can tap on, yeah. and he has his own channel spectrum to tap on. That might work. Set so. up some repeaters, maybe. Yeah. Be careful with repeaters. Uh, Wi-Fi repeaters. They can slow things down by cutting your airtime in half, because. You it listens and it retransmits, and so it hears packets, buffers a couple, retransmits. Nothing else can transmit while it's transmitting. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of so that try try that only as a last resort. I don't think you're going to be happy with a Wi-Fi repeater. Okay. The UDP packets are second class citizens on Wi-Fi. Because your Wi-Fi AP is not going to send out any packets if nobody's listening to them. So your client has to ask the AP, do you have some UDP packets on this port that I can take? Send them to me. So they, they so, yes. so real-time video over RTP is not good because yeah. it's, it's, you get a lot of jitter in the spurts yeah. of data. That's right. Um, don't underestimate your effort at running cable very yeah. craftily. <laughs> Be, I mean, ultimately, copper is your friend, and you, even possibly the position of, of the, the Comcast modem in, in the house might also be optimized. So there's a minimum on number of, of posts or joists in the way, but if you can, Route the route a cable up to the second floor that he doesn't object to, you know. Get some, uh, you know, they you can buy uh, cable chases that look really tidy, put it up in the corner of the room, and you know I've drilled through floors before. Yeah, I think so, it'd be a drilling. Uh, since yeah. Here. Uh huh. So you you would have to enroll your roommate in or your landlord into accepting the it as an upgrade so that he has wired ethernet upstairs for when you move out and other clients can have it so but if it's if it's if it's done if, if it's done respectfully and it looks professional he shouldn't have a, i mean he might not have a problem with it but stringing a long oh, a string a long 100 foot ethernet cable across across the floor is well no theater person would accept that because they would want to get out their gaffing tape. Pulls across two floors and up the stairwell. So, <laughs> right, yeah. You, but your best bet, of course, is keep as much copper in there as possible. Okay. Then look for a different different channel to operate your own your own traffic so on. Go outside the house and around the house. I've done that yeah. before. Uh huh. Yeah, you can buy outdoor rated Ethernet cable. Yes. Uh huh. 
Yeah. If that's an option. Yeah. yeah. You can also buy underwater rated Ethernet cable. I've done that too. So. Yeah, we've got very cable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I had to had to route some cable through some conduit that was filled with water below a certain point. <laughs> Drilling a hole in the floor would actually be uh, one of the most reasonable rather than going outside because if the modem is below me, it's uh -huh. just that it's a ways around to get up. But yes. If you go straight That's up, right. it would uh -huh. be quite feasible. That's right. Are, uh, are we close to our time? How close are we to uh, needing to clear like out? At least four more minutes. Actually, there's no, there is another presentation in this room. Okay. Sure. Any any more questions? I actually have one that kind yeah. of relates to that. Like yes. In the event that running the cable is not an option, if it's a closed electrical circuit that just their townhome is on, yeah. are the PO or Ethernet over power line, are they just trash like the repeaters, or how would that kind of, would that maybe solve it? That's an interesting option. I haven't heard that discussed lately. Um, I think the quality on those is, is probably respectable. I wouldn't ex I, I would expect probably at most about 100 megabits though. But it would it would not suffer from unusual jitter or lag unless the quality of the electrical system was suspect. So if someone turns on the washing machine and you lose your network traffic, it's because there's some load <laughs> spike going on to, like you're you might not have a properly grounded leg of your electrical system. I've yeah. not noticed those kinds of issues before. Okay. What are we talking about, POE? Well, over e e Ethernet over power, okay. EOP, yeah. Um, power over Ethernet is a different different technology, yes. But that's, that's, a, that's a good suggestion, though. There, that is an option. Those kits are affordable. You said something about lawnmowers? You mean electric lawnmowers? Yeah, okay, so a spark plug, a spark plug is a broad spectrum transmission device. <laughs> really? Yep. Even in gas engines? Uh, yep, you're, give, you're giving off a big electromagnetic bang. You ever turn an AM radio on and then start your car? Right. <laughs> yeah, sounds, sounds terrible, yeah. FM was much better respond, much better at tolerating spark plugs than AM radio ever was. Yeah. More questions? Do you want to? Are you? Do you want? If you want to look at the slides for uh, for the different uh, details on the 802.11 specs, I have them. I can race through them if you're interested. Sure. Or uh, other wild ideas about Wi-Fi, I'm welcome to entertain. So. But I think that if you guys want to make it to another talk, um, I think I think our time slot is seconds away from being up. So, but thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Good questions. <laughs>